Uh, well, good morning. I'm Danny Levins, uh, senior pastor here at Calvary. And uh, before the sermon, let me just point out that after the worship service, so after our closing song, uh, the church elders and their wives are going to be down front. If there's something that you'd like uh, to pray with uh, one of our elders and their wives about, then uh, come on down front. We'll be down here uh, and happy to pray with you about that. Well, today we're going to continue in our preaching series through Luke's gospel, through the third gospel. And we are in the middle of the central section of Luke's gospel, chapters 9 through 19, that are all about discipleship. And remember, we've said that discipleship is the grace-driven, self-denying pursuit of Jesus and his mission. And in this section that we've been in for the last couple of months or so, we've seen several things about discipleship. And let me just summarize. We've seen that discipleship involves total commitment to Jesus. It involves carrying out his mission, uh, praying to the generous Father who's uh, ready to answer our prayers. It involves taking on opposition. It involves giving generously, as Jared mentioned a minute ago. That's a part of our worship, a part of our discipleship. And it also involves, as Rob talked about last week, having Jesus as our priority. Well, what we come to today in our passage, which is Luke chapter 15, is we're going to see something else about discipleship. We're going to see that as disciples of Jesus, we are to rejoice in God's grace. We are to rejoice in God's grace. Now, what do I mean by God's grace? Well, in Luke's gospel, God's grace refers to God's promised salvation in Jesus, that gift of salvation that he gives us in Jesus, and the privilege of following Jesus and carrying out his mission, and the strength to even do that. So God's grace refers to all those things, the gift of salvation in Jesus, the privilege of carrying out his mission, and the strength to do that, to carry out his mission. And that sounds great, doesn't it? God's grace. We want that, right? That sounds like a wonderful thing that we would want, but you know what happens is often we don't want God's grace. We reject it. And there are several reasons we might, we might do that. We might reject his grace. One is that we just don't think that we need it because we feel like that we are good enough on our own. We don't need God's help. We are good enough. That's one reason we reject his grace. Another reason is that we think of ourselves, or at least we want to think of ourselves, as being better than other people. Now, we may not say it out loud, but we will have those thoughts that of superiority over someone else when we look at them and we see how much harder working we are than they are, or how much more holy we look than they look. And we will have that superiority in our minds and in our hearts. And that uh, is something that God's grace confronts, as we will see today. And so we reject his grace because of that. And then there's a whole other kind of person or other kind of attitude uh, because this can happen in the same, all these things can happen in one person. There's the person who sins and thinks so terribly of himself or herself and thinks, God could never forgive me. I could never even forgive myself. That attitude or that person doesn't want grace either. You see, all these and many other reasons are reasons that we reject God's grace. But what we're going to see in our passage today is that instead of having those attitudes as disciples of Jesus, we can live a life of joy. Specifically, a life where we are rejoicing in God's grace, living in humility, worshiping God, loving and serving others in response to his grace for us. And our passage today, Luke 15, gets us on the right, right track as far as God's grace is concerned. And so, what we're going to see is after a group of religious leaders challenge Jesus because he is eating with sinners, Jesus is going to respond by telling three stories, three parables that highlight God's grace. And so here's the outline of what we're going to see in Luke 15. Three parables, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And so we're going to walk through each of those parables, and as we do, we're going to see God's grace and how we can respond by rejoicing in God's grace. And we'll talk about different ways that looks practically kind of as we move through the passage. So if you haven't yet, open your Bible to Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
All right, so in verses 1 to 2, what we see here is Luke describes the group of people that is gathering around Jesus, and it's not exactly a respectable crowd. It's sinners and tax collectors, two groups that are not viewed highly in first century Judaism. And in fact, the fact that Jesus was spending time and eating with such a shady group of people, it offended the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees, the, the reason they were offended is because they believe that, that coming close to God, that being in, in line with God meant that, we, that, that, that God's people were to be separate from anything that is sinful, to be ritually pure and clean. And so because of that, they don't like the fact that Jesus is eating with these sinners, these sinful people. Well, what we're going to see now in verse 3 through the rest of chapter 15 is we're going to see Jesus answering this objection. We have to read the rest of this chapter in light of this very question that's raised here. Jesus is trying to answer this question. Why does this man, Jesus, eat with sinners? And the answer that we're going to see in the passage is that Jesus eats with sinners in order to celebrate how God has saved them. He is rejoicing in God's grace. And Jesus communicates that answer through three stories. And so let's take a look at the first one, the parable of the lost sheep. And he told this parable, What man of you, in verse 4, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And the answer that's assumed here is that anyone would go after the lost sheep. There's no doubt about that. And in verse 5, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. You see what happens when the sheep is found? The shepherd rejoices, and he, he doesn't just rejoice on his own, though he, he does rejoice on his own. He's happy that the sheep it was not killed or lost and something bad happened to it, uh, but he calls others to rejoice. He throws a party, and he says, come rejoice with me because of this good thing that has happened. And then in verse 7, Jesus applies this rejoicing back to the question that the Pharisees asked about him eating with sinners. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So Jesus' answer to this question, why do you eat with sinners, is I eat with sinners to celebrate what heaven celebrates, to celebrate what God celebrates, namely that sinners have come to repentance and have received God's promised salvation. They have received God's grace, and so I'm celebrating that. That's his answer. Now, in this verse, he uses an important word, the word repent. Now, what does that word mean? Well, repentance involves, or it means, at least two things. It means, first of all, to turn away from sin, and then secondly, to turn to God and to God's promised salvation in Jesus. So that is what these sinners have done. These sinners that Jesus are eating with, they have repented. They have turned from their sin. They've admitted that they are sinners and that they need a Savior. And this is really important because this is the opposite of what Jesus describes here when he describes these 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, when he says righteous persons, here he's referring to people who think they are righteous but really aren't. And he's referring to, when he says, who need no repentance, he's referring to people who think they need no repentance, but they really do. Because all of us desperately need repentance. None of us are righteous, and it's these sinners that have recognized that. And that's the important first step of repentance, to acknowledge our sin, to admit it, and to turn to God. And then secondly, well, that's the second part, they turn to God to receive his promised salvation in Jesus. These sinners, these tax collectors have done that, and so Jesus is celebrating that with them. And so having seen that, we can see already in this first parable why Jesus is eating with sinners. He's doing it to celebrate God's grace. And that brings us to our response from this passage, namely that we are to celebrate or to rejoice in God's grace. We're to rejoice in God's grace, and the first way we are to do that is to repent 
and receive God's grace, his salvation in Jesus. And this response that this passage calls us to, it can be hard for us. Because as I said in the beginning, I think we often don't feel like we need to repent. The average modern American person, like the Pharisees in this passage, the average modern American person is very confident in their own goodness. I mean, that's sort of a part of the fabric of who we are. We, we feel like that we are pretty good people. That's the dominant view of human nature today. And add to that that we live in the good old Midwest, all right, where people are very nice. We are much nicer and better than people who live in other parts of the country who are rude and mean and selfish, right? Uh, we go to church here. We help other people here. And so we feel pretty good about ourselves and how we stand. We think we are righteous and that we don't need to repent. But just like the Pharisees, we are dead wrong. Because here's what we're missing. In our common view of human nature, we are missing the fact that God does not ask of us or demand of us that we be pretty good people or that we do our best. God demands of us holiness. We are to be holy as he is holy. He demands that we love and trust him perfectly and that we do what he calls us to do only and say what he calls us to say only all the time for the right reason, giving glory to God forever. That's the standard, perfection. And none of us can meet that. And what's more, our niceness and our Midwesternness mask the evil that is in our hearts. Because what's really going on in our hearts, even though there's a niceness on the surface, is that we deeply love ourselves and we are in rebellion against God. And because of that, we deserve condemnation. We deserve eternal separation from God because of our sin. But here's the good news. God, by his grace, has saved us in Jesus. You see, we could never be holy as God is holy. We couldn't. None of us could. But there was one who was or who is. Jesus, God's own son, perfectly loved his father, did only what his father told him to do and said only what his father told him to say and then he died sacrificially for us. God instead of punishing us for our sin punished his innocent son. Jesus took the penalty we deserved and what's more Jesus not only that not only did he take what the penalty we deserved but he gave us his righteousness his goodness his love of God his perfect obedience is credited to us and that's God's grace. It's nothing we have done. We contribute nothing to salvation. God did it all through Jesus. What we couldn't do, God did. And now our part, our response, is to repent and believe in him. To do those two steps I talked about earlier. To, to first of all admit our sinfulness, that, that we uh, don't meet God's standard of perfection and that we uh, have sinned against God and, and say to him, I'm not good enough, I can't do this. And then secondly, turn to him and receive the free gift of salvation that he offers in Jesus. And if that's something that you've never understood and if God might be moving in your heart, then I, then I urge you to go to God and repent and believe in Christ. And you can express, if that's the desire of your heart, you can just express that to God in prayer by saying, Lord, I, I'm a sinner and I need you. I, I repent, I turn to you, I receive the salvation that you offer in Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for saving me. And, and again, the words are not important, but the point is, is what's going on in your heart, that you turn to him and be saved. And that's the first way that we re rejoice in God's grace, by receiving his salvation through repentance and faith. Now, what we're going to see in the next two parables is that this response that we just talked about is going to be affirmed, this response of repentance. But we're also going to see some other ways that we can respond uh, by rejoicing in God's grace. So let's look at the next story Jesus tells, the parable of the lost coin. Verse 8, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. 
All right, so the silver coin is the equivalent of a day's wage uh, in, in that day. And so this woman is turning the house upside down to try to find this coin in the story. And in verse 9, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Again, do you see the response? Rejoicing. And then Jesus applies the parable in verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Again, we see here Jesus answering that question. Why are you eating with sinners? Because I'm celebrating God's grace, what he has done by calling sinners sinners to salvation through repentance. Now, there's one more parable that we're going to look at, the parable of the lost son. So let's take a look at that in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. All right, just so you know, if we were reading this story to people in ancient Judea, there would have been a complete silence in the audience at this point. It would have been revolting what this younger son just did. To ask for his inheritance while his father was still alive, that basically amounts to him saying to his father, I wish you were dead. It's him rejecting his family completely. And so this is a, a big deal. And, and this does not get the, the audience or the readers on the side of this younger son. And what comes afterwards doesn't exactly improve his status. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. All right, so he takes his father's inheritance and he wastes it. He uses it on whatever he wants to do, and then things continue to get worse in 14 and 15. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. All right, so he has no money. He's far from home. A famine hits, okay, so it makes the condition even worse, and he has to take a bad job. All right, I've had lots of bad jobs. My first job, I was a dishwasher at a steakhouse. That was a bad job. It's hot, and it's just dirty, okay? I had a job one time where I worked for a painter for a month, and during one whole week of my time working for this painter, my job was to scrape gum out from underneath Jim bleachers so he could paint the bleachers every day, all day for a week. Now that was hard work and it was gross, all right? But that was my job. That was a bad job. But this is even worse, okay? For a Jew to have to feed pigs, okay? That's gross, but it's also against a Jew's, Jew's beliefs because pigs are unclean animals. And so there are theological problems with this job. This guy is in bad shape. And what's more, in verse 16, he's starving. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Do you see the picture that's being painted here by Jesus in this story? I mean, he talked about how he was, you know, at the beginning, he was spending time with sinners, okay? Well, if you want a picture of a sinner, this is it, okay? This guy has taken everything good and wasted it, and now he is in the worst condition possible. I mean, this is a beautiful picture of a sinner. And look at what happens in verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. You know what you see happening right here? The lost son repents. Now, the word repent is not in there, but that's exactly what he is doing. He's acknowledging that he has sinned against heaven, meaning sinned against God. He has sinned against his father, and he has decided that he is going to go and ask for mercy from his father, at least to be one of his hired servants, because they have it better than he does. So the question is now, 
how is the father going to respond? The same father whom this son basically disassociated himself from, said, I wish you were dead. How is that father going to respond to his selfish, evil son? Well, let's read verses 20 to 24, and I want you to look at how the father responds. What does he do? And he, the son, arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. What does his father do? His father ran to him. He didn't even wait for his son to get back. He had compassion on him and he ran to meet him. And then he accepted his son back in the family. His son came and and his son son didn't even have the chance to make the I'll just be one of your servant speeches. The father cut him off and he said, bring him the best robe, the signet ring, uh, which are symbols of his sonship. He was accepted completely back into his family. And then look, the father rejoiced. In the other stories, when the thing that was lost was found, uh, there was rejoicing. And that's exactly what happens here, except to a much greater degree. I mean, here, what we see is that the father is basically throwing a big party. And when it says that the fattened calf is to be killed, know that that is the best meal that they will eat in their lives. I mean, this is going to be a huge party, a huge celebration And the father is rejoicing that his son, who was dead and lost, is now alive and found. Do you see this grace here? It's almost unbelievable that this father would act this way. This son that deserved justice, that deserved scorn, that deserved so much evil that he had done. And yet this father responds this way. And that brings us to our second response from this passage. The second way we rejoice in God's grace. We know that God loves us. Even in our sin, know that God loves you. And I think this is hard for us. I know it's hard for me. Because often when we sin, we can think, oh, you know, God, he he doesn't love me. He doesn't forgive me. Maybe we've done something so bad or we've done the same thing over and over again, and we think God won't forgive me. We think God can't love us. But listen, this is wrong thinking, and here's why. When you're thinking that way, you are thinking that God's love for you is based on what you do, that it's based on your performance, and it's not. What did we talk about just a minute ago? None of us can meet God's perfect standard. If it is up to us, then we won't be loved by God. I mean, think about the story. If the father's love for the son were based on how the son acted, then the father probably would have drop-kicked him to Egypt when he came home. I mean, he would, have, he would not have responded the way that he responded. But that's not what the father's love was based on. And if the father's, if, if our father, if God's love were based on how we acted, then God would not love us. It would be a closed case. But it's not. Remember grace. Remember what God did. He gave us Jesus. Jesus took the punishment for sin we deserved. And he gave us his righteousness. And when we are trusting in him, God does not see our disobedience He sees the obedience of Jesus, and he loves us just as he loves Jesus. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we as Christians can go sin all we want, okay? No, that's not the right response to God's grace. The right response to his grace is that we go and we surrender our lives to him and live for him. At the same time, nothing we do earns God's favor. We have it already 
in Jesus. Calvary Bible Church, do not miss this. God's love for you is not based on the fact that you didn't sin much this week or that you had devotions this week or on how much you give. No, his love for you is based on one thing, your union with Jesus, his son. He loves Jesus, therefore he loves you. And so when you sin, go to him. Be honest with him about your sin and know that he loves you. When you have those thoughts that accuse you and say, God does not love you because you've done this or that, reject that. Get rid of it. It is a lie. Remember that this passage shows you how God responds to you. What did the Father do in the passage? That is how God responds to you when you sin and when you repent and you turn to him. He runs to you. He clothes you in Jesus' righteousness. He calls you his child and he loves you. Therefore, your response when you sin is to go to your father, admit your sin, and receive his love for you. Don't believe those lies. Remember this picture here in Luke 15. That's how he loves you. I love how the hymn writer said it. And we're actually going to sing this song at the end. But the second verse of of this particular hymn goes like this. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see Jesus there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. See, that's God's love for us. Remember that. Remember his grace. But the parable's not over. There's another son. So let's read on, starting in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Now, if we didn't know God's grace, then the elder son's response here would seem perfectly appropriate, wouldn't it? Because what's he arguing? He's saying that love is based on me earning it. He said, look at these many years I have served you. Look at all the good things that I've done. He feels like he has earned the father's blessings. And the older son says, and you haven't even killed a goat for me, much less a fattened calf. I mean, doesn't this resonate with us? Don't we relate to the older son here? And additionally note that the older son is critical of his younger brother. And in fact, he doesn't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours has done all these things. And he names these different things. In other words, he's saying, he hasn't earned what you have given him. And that makes complete sense to us, doesn't it? Don't, can't we relate to this? Can't we? Because, because that's how we naturally think about life. That you earn things. But that's not God's grace. God's grace forces us to think differently. We no longer come to God based on this system of earning. We come in a whole new way. Back several years ago, I got my first ever smartphone. It was a Palm Trio. Anybody have Palm Trios back in the day? It had one of these little pins, you know, in the side, little stylus things, and you had this language you would write in it, and it was amazing. You kept your contacts and your calendar, and it was a phone all together in one thing, revolutionary, right? So, so I had that trio, and I used it, and I got pretty good with it. And then later on, a few years later, I got an iPhone. 
and it was very different, okay? iPhone didn't come with a little pen, okay? <clears throat> and I couldn't do things the way I did on my old phone. It had a whole new different operating system that it worked on. And if I tried to take a pen and use it on the iPhone, it wasn't going to work. Or if I tried to do things that I did on my Trio before, it wouldn't work on the iPhone at all. I had to learn the new system. Well, that's what grace is. It is a whole new system. It's a whole different way of thinking about God. It's not that works-based system uh, that we imagine where we earn things. No, we don't relate to God that way at all. God doesn't operate that way. He operates in terms of grace. And in this case, the elder son is using the wrong operating system. He's on a palm trio, okay? He's got his little stylus out, and he's trying to earn the blessings of the father. But he is off because the father operates by grace. His younger son has repented and returned to him, and that means it's time to celebrate. And it's really interesting how the father responds to the elder son in verses 31 and 32. He doesn't get angry at him. He actually affirms his elder son and also challenges him to operate under this system of grace. Look at 31 and 32. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. You see the grace here from the Father? He's saying, everything I have is yours. You have all that's mine, always. You see, he responds to the older son with grace. But then in verse 32, he confronts him gently. He says, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The father says it's fitting to celebrate because the younger son has repented. He's been saved by grace. And so by saying this, the father is implicitly calling his older son to, to use this new operating system, to, to live by grace. And Jesus, by the way, is calling the Pharisees, remember back the, the big picture story of Luke 15? He's calling them to this new to this system of understanding how God operates, this system of grace, so that when sinners repent, they are received by God and are saved by Him. And this takes us right back to our response from this passage, that we are to rejoice in God's grace. And specifically, a third way we can do that is we are to be humble. We are to be humble. I heard a story of how an older pastor, and this was in a context where he was teaching a group of younger pastors. He was teaching them, uh, and he said, if you want to make the people in your congregation mad, tell them all the things that they have to do. Follow this law, do this, and, and do that, and that'll make them upset. But the, the old pastor said, but if you really want to get them angry, tell them that they can't do anything. And that will make them livid. Because being helpless goes right against our pride. Because we don't want to be helpless. We want to be strong. But God's grace calls us to humility. That's exactly what Jesus is communicating with these stories. That we relate to God, not based on our earning, on what we do, but based on his mercy alone, his grace. And here's what that means. It means that we are not better than anyone. There is a level playing field at the foot of the cross. And so when we are tempted to look at someone else who doesn't work as hard as we work, who doesn't look as good as we look, in that moment we have to reject that thought. Put it away. Because we are no better than anyone else. We are all vessels of his mercy, recipients of his grace. All of us deserve nothing from God. We all desperately need his grace, and so we are to be humble towards others. But not only that, we're to be humble towards God as well. Because sometimes we can, we can work ourselves up, and we can get mad at God. Because sometimes we, 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 like the older son in the passage, we feel like we've done all these things for God, that, that we've you know, sacrificed all these things, and therefore God owes us. He owes us something because we've served him so well. But no, that's operating under the wrong system. 
That's a system of works, and that is not how we relate to God. We relate to God by his grace, and what Scripture teaches us is that we have nothing that has not been given to us, that everything we have is from the hand of God, and that we have earned nothing from him. And so we go to God in humility, thanking him for everything that we have. And in fact, that's one practical thing I'd encourage you to do this week. I'd encourage you to take some time each day, 15 minutes each day, to spend some time thanking God. Don't ask him for anything. Don't, don't, I mean, just thank God for things. Thank him for his grace. Thank him for what he's doing in your life. Uh, however God leads you, just spend 15 minutes each day thanking God because the very practice of thankfulness both demonstrates and yields humility in our lives. By thanking God, we're acknowledging that he is the one who gives. And so I challenge you to do that this week. I think that'd be a great response to this passage. And then finally, I think the last response that we can say that that comes out of our passage is that we are to worship God for his grace. I mean, doesn't this passage just show us how great God is? I mean, we see that he loves all the younger brothers who, who are rebelling actively against him. And he also loves the older brothers who are pridefully trying to get God in their debt. He loves us all. In our rebellion and in our pride, he loves us. And he gave his son Jesus to die for us and to bring us back to him. And so let's close the service by offering our worship and our praise to him. Stand with me if you will, and we'll pray, and then we'll sing a song of response and worship. Father, as we look at this passage, we see how great you are. Your grace toward the proud, your grace toward the rebellious, and we worship you. We thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for loving us even in our sin. Thank you that you have taken Jesus, our punishment for sin, and you have given us your righteousness. And it's in your name that we praise you and sing. Amen.